Let's have a look and see what we can learn. We're going to, today, Mitzvah Hashem, today, tomorrow, uh, maybe even Thursday, see how long it spills over. Uh, but we're going to look at Kabbalat Shabbat. Kabbalat Shabbat is a, a rather unique prayer that we've got because really Kabbalat Shabbat is preparation for davening Mayriv, for davening the evening service. And we don't, we don't have that anywhere else. You know, during the rest of the week, if you want to daven Mayriv, so you just start with Baruch and get going, right? You want to daven Mincha, you just Ashrei and the Amida and get going. But all of a sudden over here, we've got a whole series of prayers that are being recited, which are supposed to be bringing us to the point where we're ready to daven Mayriv the way that we're supposed to, right? To accept Shabbat. So let me ask you a question. I know it's not fair, and especially questions that are centered around davening, because, you know, for those who do daven, it's like, it's enough that I daven. Why do you want me to know what I'm saying as well? That's outrageous, right? But nevertheless, let's see, let's see what we can come up with. Um, Patrick, no, no cheating. I heard that little Velcro tear over there, right? and I knew, I, knew exactly what you were, I knew exactly what you were going to do. Um, let, let's have a look and see. In, in, the, in the, uh, the build up, before we get to Lechodoidi, which is a song which is sung inside of Kabbalat Shabbat, does anybody know how many chapters of Tehillim are recited? How many chapters of Psalms are recited? Wow. That was, that was uh, I mean, first of all, that was really good. Secondly, you've just taken the wind out of my sails because normally nobody has a clue, right? And you, you, you know, that's outrageous. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there are six chapters of Tehillim which are recited starting with the Lechun Ranana, working its way through until we get to Lechadoidi. Here, you're already, you're already on a roll. Do you know why? Because it's each, each day, each one represents a different day of the this week. This is fantastic. Here, you know, I don't need to be here. You, you can come and you can... Uh, first of all, you come as late as I do. So that's... that's <laughs> you've, already, you've already worked out the, the, you know, the style has already been taken care of. Um, the, uh, yeah, each, each, each chapter is going to represent one day of the week. Now, we're not going to do this over here, but if you look carefully at each chapter, you'll be able to see how it relates. Sometimes it's easier, sometimes it's a little bit harder to make the connection, but the first chapter is going to relate to Sunday, the second chapter relates to Monday, the third chapter relates to Tuesday, the sixth chapter, of course, is going to relate to Friday. All of this, what, what are we doing? So we need to try to understand, because there's something very, very beautiful about Kabbalat Shabbat. There's something very lofty about it as well, something very, very spiritual. Um, I think in order to understand this well, maybe, maybe what we're going to do is we're going to go on a hot air balloon journey. Has anybody here ever been on a hot air balloon? Never, Malachi. Yeah? Patrick, you look to me like somebody who would, uh, would, have, done, <laughs> would have done something like that. <laughs> um, hot air balloons, how do they work? They're, they're really very simple. You've got this enormous balloon, and it's full of gas, and uh, you know it floats up into the air. How does it float up into the air? Well, if you just let the ropes go, it will jerk up very unevenly, and it will be very uncomfortable. However, in order, in order to let the balloon go up gently, there are sandbags inside of the basket. Of course, when you get into the hot air balloon, I guess that makes you a basket case, right? But uh, there are there are bags of sand, sand bags inside of, the balloon, inside of the basket, and you let them go one by one, right? And you're letting off weight. What are you doing? They'll go, that, that will allow you to move up gently. Like that. Right? Thank you. You're there. You, you've caught on. Good. <laughs> <coughs> Excellent. Um, <clears throat> what we've got in our, in our hot air balloon, we've got six sandbags. We, we've got to try to let go of the physicality of the weak in order to be able to elevate ourselves and to move ourselves upwards into the realms of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, to be together with God, which is what Shabbos is all about. So the first psalm that we recite is going to help us relieve the physicality of the Sunday and leave us just with a spiritual dimension. The second psalm that we recite is going to take care of Monday and then Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday. And of course, we're moving upwards slowly and gently in the way that we're supposed to do. Yeah. Why was it first put in place? Where did they first, like, where did they first... It's an interesting it? question. Where, I don't know exactly when Kabbalat Shabbat came into being. It's something which is very early. Um, the Gemara in Shabbos talks about the, the, you know, the Tanoim and the Amoraim, which are the, the rabbis within the Talmud, going out to greet the Shabbos bride and to bring her in 
uh, how they got how they got ready, how they dressed. So, in Mitzvah Hashem, when we get to Lechadoidi, we'll talk about the uh, you know this idea of boi chala. A lot of uh, not a lot, but some of uh, some of some of Lechadoidi is built on the words of the Gemara and Shabbos mm. that the different Tanoim would get themselves ready, right? Let's go out and greet the Shabbos. That was the way that one Tana would go. The other one would say, Boi Chala, Boi Chala. You know, that the, the Kala should come in, the Shabbos queen should come in. That was another, uh, you know, another, uh, another method that one of them would use. Um, so in the format that we've got it, I don't know. I would hazard a guess, although it's only a guess. Most of the davening that we have, most of the tefillahs that we have, date their ways back to the Anshe Knesset HaGadola, which are the men of the Great Assembly. We're talking about in the immediate aftermath of the destruction of the Temple, the First Temple. So we're going back 2,500 years, give or take, maybe a little, a little bit less. Um, was it put into place then? Very possibly. Did it come a little bit later? Very possibly. It's definitely something which is very early. Right? How early? I don't know exactly. Yeah. Um, somebody told me that a lot of the songs that we now sing in Kabbalah, for Kabbalah Shabbat are uh, from uh, Rabbi Karabach. The tunes, not the, the songs tunes. themselves, the words. Oh, the tunes? Yeah, the word, the word. We'll talk about the word. We'll talk about it all when we get to it. We're not, we're not quite there. In a, oh, you know, yeah. Hold on, just hold on. The, the, way, the way that Kabbalat Shabbat is the format is that we've got to get through those six. Those six paragraphs have to be got through first. I think, I, I don't know if I mentioned it, it was over here, I can't remember, but it, 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 I always think it's very sad when, you know, people, they've had a, a long, hard week mm. and they get into shul and the first thing they do when they get into shul is fall asleep. And then they wake up when, normally, oh, that's not true, they normally wake up when there's baruch they all sort of stand up and then they <laughs> baruch and then they sit themselves back down and go back to sleep again until after davening, right? And I think it, it's, it's really, it's very sad because the opportunity to, to daven Kabbalat Shabbat is something which, first of all, only comes once a week and it's something which is going to allow our Shabbos to turn into something completely different, right? We're, we're, we're moving into a different realm by using Kabbalat Shabbat properly. It's the only service that actually fully connected. Yeah, good, very good. I mean, it's, you know, I, I, I empathize with you. It's a very beautiful thing. And the more you understand about it, the more beautiful it becomes, which means, that, again, each, each paragraph is going to take care of one day of the week, which means that in order to be able to, to elevate myself, I've got to let go of the physicality of Sunday. And then I've got to let go of the physicality of Monday. Again, there's nothing wrong with physicality. We spoke about that yesterday. Physicality is great, and it's something that should be used but we've got to use it correctly, which means that we're going to draw away from the physical and become more spiritual, and that's what those paragraphs are doing. What is, yeah? Is there some connection between each one? The Absolutely, each one yeah. And, 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 and again, I'm not, I'm not going to go through it over here because it would take, we, we could do it for a year, we could do it. But if you look carefully, um, like I mentioned before, some of them you'll see the connection very easily, and for some of them it'll be a little bit more difficult. Like, for example, on the sixth day, the paragraph that's recited on the sixth day begins with the words, Hashem Malach, God is the King. Right? On the sixth day of the creation, of course, God created Adam. And at that point, God is coronated the King over the creation. Rosh Hashanah is the day that we commemorate that. It's not the beginning of the creation and it's not the end of the creation. Rosh Hashanah commemorates the sixth day of creation when Adam was brought into the world. Uh, so that's an, an easy one to connect to, right? Yeah. Can I ask you a really weird question? Uh, of course. Yeah. But you might get a really weird answer. What should one be thinking during Kabbalah <laughs> You asked a weird question, so oh, I yeah, gave so you a weird answer. answer. Yes. Very good. Brilliant. <clears throat> well, what should you be thinking when you are davening Kabbalah Shabbat? I mean, first of all, I think, the mo I mean, maybe the most obvious thing of all is that you're, you're getting yourself ready. Again, Kabbalah Shabbat is... Is preparation. <clears throat> Given the choice between davening Kabbalat Shabbat or davening Myriv, obviously you should be davening Myriv. That's, you know, that that's the that the focus is going to be on that. But in order to get into the right state of mind to daven Myriv properly, that requires Kabbalat Shabbat, which means that I think perhaps you don't need anything more than the idea that I'm preparing myself. To receive Shabbos properly. I don't get why Marv is more important than Kabbalat <coughs> Shabbat. Because in Kabbalat Shabbat, you will come in the Shabbat. Yeah, because in, in general, what is more important, the preparation of something or the thing itself? Preparation. That, 
But have a look about the thing itself, because it, it's not our normal service. <laughs> you know what? Okay, you know what? We, we can, we can I, I, I mean, I understand what you're saying, and I, I, I empathise with what you're saying. We can agree to disagree. I think that halachically, Mariv is more important than okay. Kabbalat Shabbat. I think that emotionally, Kabbalat Shabbat is more important than Mariv. Maybe that's why they go together. True. Maybe that's yeah, why yeah. we should do them both. I don't know, but... Uh, I think as far as what your mindset needs to be when you're davening, I think it needs to be that I'm, I'm getting myself ready for Shabbos. This is it. You know, this is how I'm going to do it. The same way we spoke about, when was it? Yesterday, the day before, I think, that you have to physically prepare yourself for Shabbos. This is now spiritually right? So now we're spiritually going to prepare ourselves for Shabbos as well. What's interesting is that from the end of the six paragraphs of the beginning of Kabbalat Shabbat, before we recite Lachadoidi, which is the song that's sung, there's a little prayer which is inserted in the middle. Ana B'choyach, right? That little prayer over there is something of tremendous spiritual importance. So let's go back for a moment. Let's go back to our hot air balloon. We have drifted up now <clears throat> in our hot air balloon. We've let go of all six of the sandbags. We're now wafting our ways upwards, but... We need to get up to where the winds are going to be able to carry us, which takes a little bit of a boost. So what do you do at this point in your hot air balloon? You pull on your string and you set off a, sh uh, you know, a, a, a sheet of fire, a flame goes up into the center of the hot air balloon, burns up the gas. Everything is now, it's like a turbo boost. It's like pushing it up, the, the, uh, pushing the hot air balloon up into the the uh, atmosphere where there's going to be, it's going to be able to catch the winds and it's going to be able to go in the direction that it's going to go in, right? We need to do that as well, which means that it's not enough just to let go of the physicality of the six days of the week. We still can't just step into Shabbos without doing something that's going to boost us and push us up into the realms of Shabbos itself. That's where Anna B'chayach comes in. What was that inserted before? I, I don't, again, I don't know, and you've got to stop asking me questions that I don't know the answers to. It's, it's really, it's Who's a... Who's the author anyway? Who's the author of Anna B'choyach? I, I do not know, but <laughs> in, a, in a minute we'll see that Anna B'choyach is the most, it's the most incredibly spiritual thing. Um, it, could, it could be that its origins perhaps, I mean, maybe its origins are divine, I don't know. You got it over there? Does it say who? who so this describes the mystic prayer to the Tana Rav Rav. I can read that. Nachan Nia Ben Han Hakana. Oh, okay, very good, right? Rabbi Nachan Nia Ben Ben Hakana, which is which is the uh, he he was he was one of the we're talking about very early over here. We're talking about somebody who's very very uh, kabbalistic and his, his his teachings are very kabbalistic. <coughs> can I can I use this for the minute? I just want, I want to show you something. If you take a look in Anna B'choyach, in most Sidurim that you're going to look at, you'll see that on the side there are a series of little letters. Right Now, you may or may not have paid any attention to this when you were davening. If you did pay attention to it, then you've probably had sleepless nights wondering why they're there. And, you know, obviously it's been a very difficult period from you from the time that you've known this until today. I am going to reveal all to everybody now at this point, which means that tonight you'll probably have your first decent night's sleep since the time that you realize that those little letters are there. And not fall asleep during that one. Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> <clears throat> Over here in this class, we deal with practicality, not with fantasy. <laughs> here. What, what are those little letters on the side over here? So let's try to understand where Anna B'choyach here. You see them over here? Anna B'choyach is comprised of seven lines, and there are six words in each line. The numbers over here are going to be very important. Seven times six is how much? 42. 42. There is a very mystical name of God. Again, don't ask me to explain this. I mean, obviously, I understand it perfectly, but you people are far too puny, and I cannot reveal this to you. And it has nothing to do with the fact that I haven't got a clue what any of this means. Uh, there is a, a name of God which is comprised of 42 letters. It's very mystical. According to some opinions, 
That is what's known as the Shem Hamaforash, the, the, uh, the, the, the name of God. Uh, whether it is or whether it's not, the Tefillah of Anna Bechoyach, the first letters of each word in each line are the letters that are used inside of this 42 letter name of God. It's not in the same order. I don't know what the order for these 42 letters are. Uh, nevertheless, we're told that we shouldn't, you, shouldn't, uh, you, can, you should look at them when you're davening Anna Bechoyach, but you shouldn't try to pronounce the various combinations of letters that come out from over here. <coughs> and what it's doing, Anna Bechoyach is a vehicle to be able to utilize the power of that 42 letter name without actually saying the name itself. So it's basically it's a vehicle to connect him. It's a, it's a vehicle to give you some kind of a, again, it's some kind of a spiritual turbo push that will bring you up into our Kodesh Baruch Hu's realm instead of trying to draw our Kodesh Baruch Hu down into your realm. Right? What we do during the six days of the week is that we, we live down here in the physical realms and we, we have God together with us down here. So we, on, bring, God, we bring God down to us. During the six days yeah. of the week. On Shabbos, though, what we're trying to do is that we're trying to draw ourselves up into God's realm in order to join together with God in, in His dimension rather than bringing Him down into our dimension. Right? That's why, interestingly enough, Shabbos, one of the names that are given to Shabbos is Me'ain Olam Haba. It's something which is a taste of the world to come. Right? Taste of the world to come means that it's, we've got a dimension inside of Shabbos which is so spiritual that it's us together with Hashem as opposed to Hashem together with us down here in the physical dimensions. Why well, do we understand that we've got a second stun, a second second soul during the during Shabbos? We'll get to that as well. Hold on. Okay. Hold on. Hold on tight. We're in a hot air balloon, right? Oh, true. <coughs> don't don't let go. Um, the, the, uh, of course, if you keep asking questions like that, somebody might want to throw you out the basket. But uh, <laughs> I know. I don't know what to do myself. Um, so that that's a function of Anna Bechoyach. What's interesting is like this: by by uh, by the Ashkenazi tradition, Anna Bechoyach is not recited very often. So we recite it over here. Some people recite it when it comes to Sfiras Um before counting the Omer. Some people do. Some people don't. Right. By the uh, by, the Sfarim, it's it's found much more often. You know what? I don't know. I know why the Sfarim they say it, they say it on Kriyish Malamita before they go to sleep at night. Um, <clears throat> it's 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 something again. It's something which is it's got the most tremendous potency to it. This particular tefillah, and it's something that when you, when you say it, now we understand we're we're not quite ready to be able to move into Shabbos yet. Until we recite Anna Bechoyach Dulosimincha, and then all of a sudden we're going to push ourselves up into the spiritual realms. <clears throat> and once we've done that, then we're ready to sing Lachadoidi. Now, let's talk about Lachadoidi a little bit. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but Lachadoidi is a fascinating and a unique kind of a prayer, if only historically. Uh, Lachadodi was written by somebody called Rashloma al Kabetz in Tzfat 500 years ago. It's all of 500 years old. It's based on Kabbalistic concepts. It's based on the concept of the Jewish people and HaKadosh Baruch Hu and Shabbos and the redemption. However, what makes it absolutely fascinating and what makes it unique is that a tefillah, a prayer that was written 500 years ago, you would not expect it to be accepted by everybody. There are lots of different communities, a lot of different congregations, and they've all got their own customs and they've got, all got their own, their own prayers, which means that the basic prayer system is the same by everybody. But depending on which community you go to, you'll find little prayers that have been added in like this or something which is not said. Like you mentioned before, you know, it is said, it's not said. It depends on which community you belong to. It's interesting, right? Because the tefillahs that are recited by everybody are the tefillahs that were written by the Ansheikh Nesak Doyle, the men of the Great Assembly. And that's, you know, that's a tradition that we have that you should say them. The tefillahs that have been added in by various different communities on the way well, if you belong to that community, then you should say it. And if you don't belong to that community, you don't say it. It's as simple as that. 
There's no overriding reason why you should be reciting a tefillah, a prayer, which is not your, it doesn't come from your community. But you say it if you're in a shul, that is, you don't say it, but... It's Here, Rav Moshe Feinstein says like this, that if you're davening in a synagogue where they use a different nusach to use they, 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 than you, they, they use a different, a different uh, um, what do you call it, a different... Tune. Text, I don't know what you want to call it. Text, not, not the tunes. Um, then he says, if it's, if it's responsive reading, everybody's saying it out loud, then he says, you should say it together with everybody else. He says, but if not, then you don't have to say it. So, for example, um, the Kedusha, which is recited in the Amida, in Shacharit and in Mincha, is slightly different. If you go to a Nusach Sfad or Nusach Sfaradit, which is a Hasidic, a Hasidic shul or a, or a Sfadi shul, it's slightly different from the Ashkenazi Kedusha. So when you, if you, if, if, here, I, I daven Nusach Ashkenaz, but if I go to a Hasidic shul to daven Mincha, so I should recite the Kedusha that they're reciting because that's something which is being recited out loud by everybody. If there, <coughs> if there are tefillahs that are recited which are, which are not, they're recited quietly, then I don't, I don't have to say them. That's not my custom to say them. I don't have to say them. So what happens if you go to a shul, when that's a Friday shul, let's say, and they do not sleep, do you have to say sleep with them? Yeah. If they're saying them out loud, then you should be davening together with them. Yes. What, what makes the Chodoidi so interesting is that it's all of 500 years old. Mm. There is no reason why Lechadoidi should be accepted by every single community. You, you can go to any shul, here, here in Yerushalayim, Baruch Hashem, there are, there are myriad different shuls with different, different uh, texts that they use. They're called, they're called Nuschaot. Different Nusach, depending on where you come from, even within, even within various communities. So, for example, in Ashkenaz, you've got Nusach Ashkenaz, you have Nusach Agro, you have Nusach that is used by the, by the Yekis, by the, the Jews from Germany. <coughs> Amongst the Hasidim, you've got different Nuschaot, you've got Nusach Ari, You've got Nusach Sfarad. You have Nusach, you know, for example, in, in Boston, the Hasidus of Boston, they have their own, their own uh, Nusach as well. When you move into the Sfadi communities, <coughs> the Sfadi communities also have their own Nuschaot. Some of them are very, very old. Right? Nusach, there's a Nusach that comes from Rome, which is considered to be one of the oldest, one of the oldest Nusachs around which is different from Nusach Italia, even though Rome is in Italy. But there was an earlier, an earlier um, established community in Rome that had their own Nusach. And then other Jews came into Italy itself and they established a slightly different Nusach, depending on whether you come from Syria or from Morocco or from Algiers, you'll see different Nuschaot that are bouncing around. There is no reason why every single shul that you go into on Friday night should be singing Lechadoidi. Do you know what amazed me once? Because there's two things that amazed me always about it. I was once taking a summer camp where basically there wasn't only <coughs> orthodox, there was orthodox reform and there was an expansion <coughs> service and then there was also a, another service. I can't remember what it was. But each service was singing Lechadoidi at the same time. It was <laughs> amazing. Cause he, and also, if you go to Kota, for example, like, like even last week at the Kota, like wherever you were, you you heard like different different yeah, communities singing. Nice. It's, it's, but it's really, if you if you if you yeah. understand Jewish history, and if you understand the evolution of prayer, then you'll understand just how incredible it is that everybody accepted upon themselves to use this prayer over here in their Kabbalat Shabbat. So one explanation that I heard is that the Arizal. Yeah. Even the Yemenites do? Even the Yemenites, yes. Whoa. Interestingly enough, yeah. the Yemenite tradition is the earliest known tradition. The Yemenite community established itself before the destruction of the first temple. Rav Avram Yitzhak Kuk, the, uh, the first chief rabbi of Palestine, not of Israel, he was uh, the, during, the, during the British mandate, uh, he writes in his Siddha, he writes that the Yemenite tradition of pronunciation is by far the most authentic. You know, the Yemenites, they, they articulate every single letter. You know, for us, for example, there's no real difference between an aleph and an ayin, or a chof and a chet. And they, they make a difference between every single one. Uh, a gimel, if you know anything about Hebrew grammar, 
is something's got a little dot inside of it that hardens it up, a dagesh, right? It hardens it up, right? But a, j- a gimel really doesn't have very often a dagesh inside of it. So, for example, when the Yemenites make the bracha over wine, they don't say bori priya gefen like we do. They say bori priya jefen. And the, the gimel is a j sound. A tough is a th sound. Right? It's a, it's a, you know, they, they, so say, says, says uh, Rav Kook, where does this pronunciation come from? He says it's a pronunciation that comes from the time of the first temple. So we get a lot wrong. We don't have it all wrong. We just have it mildly, mildly wrong, not, not all wrong. Is there um, punctuation that they use to make it a g, or is it always j? No, you'll find from time to time, you'll find, again, it's the rules of grammar, whether you put a, whether, whether, whether you put a dagesh into the gimel to turn it into a hard sound, so from time to time, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll find a gimel with a dot inside of it. Uh, but under normal circumstances, no, it doesn't have. Oh, wow. So why didn't, why didn't they change it? Why didn't, like, you know, <coughs> so again, interesting, <coughs> interesting enough, first of all, you should know that however, however to, to our untutored ears, it sounds like there's an enormous difference between different pronunciation. So the idea of there being a connection between the standard Ashkenazi Lithuanian pronunciation and the Yemenite pronunciation sounds absurd to us. However, Rav Cook points out that they're not, they're, not so, they're not so separate from each other. So for example, where does the idea of in, in Ashkenazi pronunciation of taking a taf that has no dagesh and calling it a saf, he says that's very similar to the th sound that the Ashkenazim use, uh, sorry, that the Yemenites use, and he says that's where it, it uh, you know, that's where it's coming from. <clears throat> the uh, various Sfadi pronunciations are also much closer to the Yemenite pronunciations. For us, you know, if we went into a Yemenite shul, you wouldn't have a clue what was going on. You just wouldn't. You'd go in, you'd, you'd hear the prayers, and you wouldn't, you wouldn't know where they were, right? You wouldn't know what they were saying because it all sounds so completely different. But if you pick up a sensitivity to language, you know, to being able to differentiate between the different sounds that are made, so then you can begin to work out what's going on. Why don't we all just change to the Yemenite pronunciation? So the Chassam Sofer, or the Chatam Sofer, uh, one of the great rabbis from uh, a couple of hundred years ago, he writes that it, it, it's... The, the way that we pronounce our pronunciation is something which is a Masorah, it's a tradition which is handed down from one generation to the next, and it's not for us to change it. We don't have the, we don't have the authority to be able to change it and to say here from now on we're going, to <coughs> we're going to use the Yemenite pronunciation instead. What will happen when the Mashiach comes? I don't know. I'll tell you the truth, my, my, uh, my, my, you know, my gut feeling is that when the, when, when the Mashiach comes, I think there's going to be, that, first of all, I think there's going to be a much more uniform method of prayer, pronunciation in prayer, and I think it's going to be a lot more like the Yemenite pronunciation than nothing else. So when we get started now. Yes. <laughs> I mean, again, the Chassam Sofa says that you shouldn't, you shouldn't be changing your tradition. Right? He, says that, he says a tradition has a din of being like a neder, it's being like an oath, and if you want to change it, you need to have a based in which is bigger in number and wisdom than the based in that established the original, the original neder, the original oath, which means that right now it's not for us to play around with it, but if you want to practice in the hope that when the Mashiach comes that you'll be the, you know, the first one asked to lead the mincha services, <laughs> then that's great for sure. Well, they'll probably yeah, be the only ones there on time, right? No, no so, yeah. Do you want yeah, to? I, I, isn't there something, some, there was some controversy? They found a, a Torah scroll from, I guess, the Yemen area that had a few. Um, yeah. What? <coughs> there, there are, there are, there are nine discrepancies between certain Sifrei Torah and regular, you know, the regular established Sifrei Torah. Uh, within the Yemenite tradition, the nine, the nine differences have no bearing whatsoever on the words. They are, they are grammatical. Um, sometimes something is like a vav is missing or another, another letter might be missing, which does not change. Not, none, of them, none of them have got different words inside of them. 
It's purely a uh, it's purely a grammatical thing. Where it came from, I don't know. It's a fascinating thing. It really is. Um, where these discrepancies came from. Um, what about the Samaritans? How do they pronounce their words? Also I don't. I don't know actually. Time. I don't know. I would imagine probably probably uh, probably in a, a very similar way. I would have thought. Because they were established before the temple yeah. was even built. I would I would imagine it's an interesting thing. I don't know, but uh, I would imagine I would imagine probably in a very in a very similar way. I would have thought, if if they're holding on to their traditions, you know, from one generation to the next, which is not always an easy thing to do. But I would imagine that that's what they do anyway. Back back to back to Lachadoidi. Um, so we've got a, we've got a prayer which is all of five hundred years old, which is accepted by everybody. Which is fascinating. Where did it come from? So what I heard was that the Arizal <coughs> accepted the prayer of Lachadoidi. He included it inside of his Kabbalat Shabbat. The Arizal, who of course is the, the greatest Kabbalist to have lived after Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, who established the, the concept of the Zohar and the, the more esoterical dimensions of the Torah itself. <laughs> the Arizal had a tremendous impact on prayer in general within Jewish history. And uh, the fact that the Arizal accepted it upon himself was the, the springboard for all the other communities to accept it upon themselves as well. Be that as it may, uh, it was written by Rav Shlomo al in Svat. We're talking about 500 years ago. Um, again, if, if anyone here has... Has anyone been to Svat for Shabbos? Yes. You've been there for Shabbos? You'll see that the, until today there are certain communities that follow the custom of the Arizal and his Hasidim, his disciples, that on Friday night when they get to Kabbalat Shabbat, they don't daven inside of the shul, they go out into the orchards surrounding Tzvat <coughs> in order to physically go and greet the Shabbos queen and bring her into, the, into, into the, their domain. Beautiful. Right? Beautiful. It's, a, it's a very beautiful thing, it really is. <coughs> and... Uh, Anyway, if you take a look down here, what's interesting about Lechadoidi is if you've ever looked at the translation, you'll see that very little of it actually deals with Shabbos. Most of it is dealing with the Geula, with the redemption. Is that what it says? Hitora, Hitora. Yeah, uh, wake absolutely. Up. Wake up, get yourselves, you know, get your. It's not, it's not just from there, though. It's from, it's from uh, Migdash, Melech, Ir, Malucha, that, uh, you know, the house of God. We're talking about Jerusalem. And then it says, Hisnari Mafakumi, that you should shake off the dust that's on you. And then, Hisori, sorry, wake yourselves up. Come on, let's go. You know, let's go, let's go uh, bring the Geula. So explain the Mephoshim, very beautiful idea over here about Lechadoidi, that it's talking about the Geula, about the redemption, because Shabbos is the key to the redemption. If we keep Shabbos, then the Mashiach will come. He's in Mephoshim. Huh? Are there? There, are very, there are various commentaries over here on Lachadoidi. They are no, normally the classic commentaries on the Siddha. So, for example, somebody called the Eitz Yosef, and somebody else called the Anaf Yosef, and somebody <coughs> called the... Um, something Rananan. I can't remember what the first word is. Okay. Um, but they, they, are, they are like the classic commentaries on, on the Siddha, on Tfila. <clears throat> there's a there's a tefillah, there's a commentary written by a very Kabbalistic commentary written that's used by the Yemenites in their Eitz Chaim Siddur by the Mabit, right? And over there, he he uh, you know again he's got his he's got his own uh, his his own uh, try his, his own um, commentary over here. Uh, all of these things are very beautiful, right? But the idea over here is that there is an inner redemption and there's an internal redemption and an external redemption. The external redemption is less complicated than the internal redemption. The internal redemption means that we have to want to be redeemed, which is not always, it, sound, it sounds like a very obvious thing, right? And it sounds like something which surely everybody wants to be redeemed. But the truth of the matter is we don't, we don't always live in that dimension of, you know, we, we live in the reality of what we've got and we don't always think about the redemption and we don't always think about wanting to bring about the messianic era. What is the redemption? Huh? What is the redemption? To bring the Mashiach. I'm fine. Which means like this, that Shabbos is a time for us to be able to reconnect to who we really are. And Shabbos is a time for us to be able to bring about the internal redemption, that I want to be together with God and I want to be freed from the 
with the, the, the mundane reality of my life right now. And if I can do that, that is what's going to bring about the external redemption. And that's the idea over here, why most of L'Chadoidi is concentrating on the concept of the Geula and not on Shabbos itself. However, let's just have a quick look at the, the first verse, because the first verse, of course, is the one that's repeated over and over again. It says, L'Chadoidi Likras Kala, come my beloved to greet the bride. Who is the beloved? Who is the bride? <clears throat> so according to the simple understanding, the beloved is God, and the bride is the Jewish people. What page? on 316. Right? That, uh, the God, you know, God and the Jewish people, let's go out, let's greet together. Panei Shabbos and the Kabbalah, we're going to bring in, we're going we're gonna to greet the Shabbos together. <clears throat> the idea of, of us calling out to God and saying, here, we're ready, we want to do this. It's, a, it's again, a very beautiful idea because the whole idea over here is us moving towards God. Shabbos is about us moving towards God in order to be able to make the connection that's needed. It's, I once heard an interesting idea. <clears throat> you know, the word Dodi means my beloved. And it's found in Shir Hashirim. It's repeated several Yom times Kippur. in Shir Hashirim. On Yom Kippur Elo, we talk about Anila Doidi, the Doidi Li, right? Um, the idea of Yom Kippur, of, of, it, it's, it's a, a very prominent theme. Yeah. The word Dod also means an uncle. I once heard from Rabbi Wine many years ago, I think it was a little bit tongue-in-cheek, but it's got something with a little bit, it's, it's, it's deep nevertheless. Why would we refer to God as being our Dod, an uncle? Because we've all got a favorite uncle. Your favorite uncle comes through, he, he, uh, you know, he gives, you, gives you presents, it's all completely unconditional, you know, he's, he, doesn't he doesn't care that you behave like a wild animal and that you're useless in school and that uh, it just, it's like he just likes spending time with you. And the idea of that unconditional love that's given by this favorite uncle is Lecha Doidi, we call our Kodesh Baruch Hu the Dod. He's that, he's that uncle that we should have this unconditional love for to recognize whatever our Kodesh Baruch Hu is doing for us, he's doing for the best. Um, here, you mentioned tunes. <coughs> A lot of the tunes that are used, of course, were composed by Rishlo Kalibach, who was the, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the composer of our generation. He died 20 years ago. Um, but uh, I, had a, I have a cousin who told me that he went uh, during his Sheva Brochas. After he got married, he went down to Miami. One of my, uh, one of my great aunts made them Sheva Brochas or something. And uh, he said that uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was a Motzei Shabbos, the Sheva Brochas, on Saturday night. And Shlomo Kalibach was invited. And he said, he said my, uh, my cousin said it was absolutely astonishing. He just sat down and just on the spot composed one of his most famous tunes. Don't ask me which one, because I can't remember. But he just sat down on the spot, like, like not, nothing. It just came out. Um, that his, you know, his tunes definitely, they emanated from inside of him. They were a part of his soul. And they came out into the open. And these are the tunes that are used by many, many communities today. Uh, use the tunes of Rosh Hashanah Kalabach. What you'll find interesting is that most places that you daven in, they'll use two different tunes. So the first two-thirds of L'Chadodi will use one tune. The second one, the second third will use another tune. Can you give us an example Just, of the tune that you would use? Ab absolutely not. <laughs> but um, don't read too much into this. The real reason for this, I've got no doubt, is because there are so many nice tunes and it's just an opportunity to change. But what I have noticed, something interesting, is that invariably when they change tunes it becomes more, the tempo changes as well. Yeah. It becomes faster. The second tune that's used. And I think that that's, an, I think that's like an, a subconscious sense of anticipation. That we're getting closer and closer to Shabbos. It's coming in. You know, the Shabbos queen is coming and we've got to get ready and we've got to, you know, we've got to be there and, and get ourselves into the right frame of mind. I think it's just like a, you know, a, really an anticipatory thing. <clears throat> I was in a shul once where they used a different tune 
for Jerusalem. every single for every single verse. Where was it? Well, where was it in Jerusalem? In Jerusalem. I think I've been to the and uh, it was it was it was very beautiful. Of course, it wasn't good for me because by the time I worked out what they were singing and started joining in, they changed, and I was singing the wrong tune, and everyone else was singing. They they moved on to a different tune already. Be, um, like <clears throat> but you'll find you know you'll find whatever wherever you go. Sometimes they'll only use one tune. Sometimes they use two. Sometimes three. Whatever they do, it's fine. Believe me, it's fine. The, the most important thing over here, of course, is for us to enjoy what it is that we're doing, enjoy that sense of anticipation. Why, <coughs> why do we repeat the twice? Boi kala, boi kala? No, what, what are you asking? Uh, we repeat it twice. Oh, that's... Uh, that, that, why don't we do it in, you know, in general with all of them? Except so we, we repeat, Lechadori is a chorus. It's interesting, when Shlom al Kabatz wrote the book, when, when he wrote the, uh, the tune... <laughs> we'll try again. When he wrote the poem, I got there in the end, right? When he wrote the poem, he wrote his name into the poem. There are ten verses in the Chadoidi, and from verse number two, the first letter is a shin. Verse number three, the first letter is a lamad, and then mem, and then hey, and it says Shloima Halevi. It spells out Shloima Halevi. Right? So it's clear that the Chadoidi is considered by the Shloima Halevi alkabets to be the chorus, the refrain for all of this. So the first time we sing it, and then we repeat it again, and then we repeat Le Chododi after each verse, because that's really the essence of what we're doing over here, is trying to accept Shabbos upon ourselves. Um, the last verse, everybody gets up and faces the back. Unless you're in Tzfat. In Tzfat they face towards Miron. Why? Because that's where Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is buried over there. <coughs> But we're not, we're not talking about Tzfat right now. We're here in Yerushalayim or wherever you might be, outside of Tzfat. There's a custom, everybody stands up, they all face to the back. And then when you say the words, Boi Chala, Boi Chala, you bow each direction and you turn around and you face back to the front again. Um, isn't that, for them to be not um, davening towards Jerusalem, isn't that like almost heresy? No, that's okay, because over here anyway, you're not going to be facing in the right direction. You're, facing, you're going to be facing backwards anyway. What's the idea? The idea is simply that you are now, this is a moment, according to many opinions, this is when Shabbos becomes a part of you, and you're now bringing in the Shabbos bride, Boi Chala, Boi Chala, according to the Mephosh and the Mashor. One of the classic commentaries of the Gemara explains that there are two moments when the parents bring the Kala down to the Chuppah. That's one Boi Kala, that's one the bride should come. And then when the husband takes the wife into his own domain, that becomes the next Boi Kala. And that's the marriage, that's how the marriage takes place over here. So Boi Chala, Boi Chala. Um, and you, you bow, and you bow, and then you turn around, and you face the front again. Um, <clears throat> I think we have to stop over here, but Emit Hashem, tomorrow, before we, before we move away from the Chodaydi, uh, we just have to discuss what you were asking about, what's called the Neshama Yitera, the Neshama Yitera, which is an additional dimension of soul, which is given to people on Shabbos, but Emit Hashem, we'll have to talk about that one tomorrow. <laughs>